Welcome to the Martin Bailey Photography Podcast. It's August 9, 2023, and this is episode 820. Today, I bring you a conversation with an awesome photographer, Matt Jacob. He's doing amazing work over in Bali and in many areas of the world that he was taken to during his job as a pilot and also now that he's based in Bali and still traveling around. I apologize for the audio quality of my mic. There was some sort of a loop in place and I couldn't hear it as we were recording. So there's a bit of an echo and the audio quality is not up to par. Um, but hopefully the conversation will keep you engaged as opposed to the audio quality disengaging you. Let's jump in now, though, and listen to my conversation with Matt Jacob. Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's an absolute pleasure to to be on here with you. Well, the pleasure is mine. I mean, I have uh, I've seen your work. I'm I'm thoroughly impressed with the quality of your portraiture and your, you know, your website and everything. You're doing a great job. Um, I I want to start by you know from the beginning. If you could just uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you, how maybe you up to the point to where you got into photography. Yeah. Um, so I was born, born in the UK um, back in the eighties. And actually I was um, kind of brought up in a, in a very, uh, my, my dad was in the Navy. Uh, my mum was a dentist and we, we were, I would say, and hopefully no offense to my parents, but kind of a non-creative household. It was a lot of sport, um, a lot of kind of doing the right things well in a, in a, in a strict, fair and structured environment. And, um, ever since, a, since I was a child, I always wanted to be a pilot and kind of, that's my story up until the age of kind of mid, mid thirties. I'm now 40, 41. Mm. And, um, it, kind of achieved that dream at an early age which which I'm extremely proud of and spent spent most of my kind of adult life up to kind of 35 enjoying being a pilot the photography uh came into my life much like I'm sure with most photographers just through happenstance and just through circumstance um and as a byproduct of me being a pilot I used to travel a lot and um you know figured out a way to tell people or, or or at least expose what I had seen to either the rest of the world or just my family and friends, right? So the, the best way I found to do that was not necessarily writing or talking. It was more with, with a camera. And so I started um, just learning through, through practice, uh, learning through, you know, there was no real, I mean, YouTube was around, but there weren't really kind of the, the free access to those type of educational materials that there are now. Um, so, you know, I used to go on a few workshops and just, just learn the craft just by doing, I touched in a lot of kind of different genres, landscape, wildlife, street and portraiture. And, and portraiture was the one kind of genre that I just fell in love with. And I found that picking up a camera, that was my way to e even just document for myself. Um, and that's kind of where it all started. And, and once I learned how to capture aesthetic beauty from it as well as a narrative or a story or just a moment um i f i really fell in love with it and uh so I, I learned as fast as i could in my spare time um just through workshops through mainly experimentation teaching myself um a couple of kind of unofficial courses online you know there wasn't a huge youtube community that i could tap into for free lessons like i guess there kind of is now um and I, you know, I loved every bit of it. And I'd, I touched upon various genres of photography. You know, I tried everything and mm -hmm. kind of settled on, uh, I guess, the human aspect side of mm -hmm. photography or, or the, the human aspect subjects that I wanted to capture um, and and hopefully translate it in, in more of a fine art way. So that was it. I kind of dived deep into into the portrait side of it. And um, very much a project based photographer now, I, I, you know, I kind of build up over a few months to do a specific project that I have my mind on and combine my travel bug with my, I guess, 
um, curiosity with culture and you know the, the photography side of it and hopefully combine all of that into one mm. i also have a studio here so we, we lived in after moving from the uk I moved from the uk when i was 30 and we lived in went to hong kong with my job and lived there for for nine years loved every minute of it until covid hit and mm. uh, covid kind of forced us to re reframe life as it did with you know nearly everyone right and um it life became quickly quite difficult and doing photography became very difficult for, for two years going on three years in in hong kong so we we decided to move to um i guess a more somewhere where we've always wanted to go which is bali we're, we're here now we've been here over every year and um part of that move a deal to myself was that if, if we move and can afford a studio then um we would find a space and rent a space to I guess practice, get creative, have other photographers in, build a little community. We started a podcast and and just have a nice, really cool creative space. So um that's where I am now and that kind of leads us up to today and and me sitting across from you in my studio and chatting about all things photography. Yeah. Well, I mean there's so much in there that I want to talk about. Um my memory is probably going to be my biggest enemy here, but um I, I have friends in Hong Kong and I, I understand that it was pretty difficult for you just getting in and getting out. Um, and if you did go out, you had to go into the gulag for, for a couple of weeks when you got back. So it was, uh, I, I can absolutely understand. Um, although it's a great place, it, it probably was, was quite, um, quite a pain to live there during the COVID years. Um, and, and yeah, yeah, I was I mean, still flying. Um, oh, I was you were? Still okay. coming in and out because yeah, I still fly now um, on a on a freelance basis. So mm. I um, just like you said, once you're in, once you were in the city, it was very open compared to mm. other countries and cities around the world. Mm. You know, there were there were still kind of general restrictions around bars, restaurants, gyms, and kind mm. of public uh, areas, but mm. um, everything was open. We never had a lockdown. There was there was not one lockdown where where you had to stay inside and couldn't go out. Yeah. So we were very very fortunate with that. But because it's a small country, it's essentially a city and a small city at that. Yeah, they just closed the borders figuratively. They didn't actually close the borders, but it made mm. it made it. They made it so difficult to go in and out or to come to mm. come back in. Essentially, were you able to it, get no one did it. going to the gulag with you being a pilot? Were you because you if you had to go out with work and come back could you sort of essentially just go home initially until they they caught on to it very quickly um especially with airline pilots so I, I fly private jets and i have friends who who fly for for airlines like cathay pacific based out of hong kong because they were doing so many flights every day or needed to especially with cargo so the airline uh, so the passenger flights were suspended but they still had to get cargo in and out of the country and so there were mm. still many many flights going in and out every day some of those crew, actually, I won't say some of those crew abused it, but it was just a matter of maths. And, you know, it was, it was bound to happen that some of these crews were going to catch COVID and if oh. and then bring it into the city if they weren't going to quarantine. Because it's a densely populated city, the government was very worried about it spreading very quickly. So, you know, I kind of understand where the, 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 the politics and the decision making was coming from. There are other arguments as to how long it went on and, and you know, playing games with people's people's livelihoods, essentially, and the politics, mm. the sub-politics that went on, which is a complete other discussion. But mm. so initially, yes. And then they caught on to that very quickly. And we had to do the same as passengers, which made oh, wow. life and work extremely difficult. I mean, sitting in a hotel room for three weeks mm. and, you know, hotels in Hong Kong, they're small rooms. It's, you know, houses are mm. smaller. Apartments are smaller in Hong Kong yeah. just because yeah. of space. So. It became um, very difficult. And if you caught COVID, if you tested positive when you came back in, you were sent off to, you know, government isolation facility, which mm. which was a, you know, a, a, a medical form of prison, essentially. Mm. So it, mm. it was it was difficult. It was difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm pleased that you got to to Bali and you've obviously I've, I, we're going to take a look at some of your work in, in a moment as well. Um and it also makes it easier to talk because we're only an hour away time time zone. Yeah. Um, but um, when you uh, when you decided to open your studio, um, 
just sort of on the business aspect, is, is there are you intending to to do portraiture for you know to charge people to do portraiture in the studio, or is it more because you mentioned that it's more like a community and you know people can come in and use the studio? Is is there a a strong business aspect, or is it more um, you know? I, I wanted this and we're going to make, we're going to have fun with this studio. Yeah. It's more of the latter. Um, mm -hmm. as a, as an expat here, um, you are not allowed to, to work as a photographer without a specific work permit. And those work permits are a very expensive, be very limited. So quite rightly, the government wants as many photographers as well as other professions, um, to be, uh, to be locally, filled you know with 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 people from from the country and so um i can't do that uh i can collaborate with with other people or we employ we employ a, a few photographers as well so there are um business opportunities with people wanting portraits but actually um most of the time we use it as uh, as creative space so i see um re really uh, if i was honest with you and myself it was just a little baby a little toy that that i wanted and mm. actually you know when 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 i think about it and I'm, i don't know whether you experienced this or, um i'd love to hear but i get rusty pretty quickly with the camera mm. you know the, mm. the 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 fundamentals are still there but if I was to have a week of not picking up a camera, which sometimes I do if I'm if I'm flying, for instance, or on holiday, um, you know, getting getting straight back, going straight back into either a paid project or a personal project, it's takes me a few days to <laughs> kind mm. of get back on my feet. So that's where the studio is really helpful. I can mm. I can practice, I can conceptualize stuff and see if it works. So that's I kind of what that. I'm using it for at the moment. Yeah. Mm. I I get rusty, but I I. I can blow the cobwebs off pretty quickly when I start. So it's, I mean, I, I will do all sorts of projects. I, as well as my photography, I, I do lots of things. I'm, I've, I've got like a whole load of hats. It's like that, those old Benny Hill sketches where he's got, he goes, <laughs> goes and puts a different hat on for everything. Um, and probably half the world won't understand Benny Hill, but, um, no, I was going to say, <laughs> it, it, but, um, it, it's, uh, you know, I can go not just weeks, sometimes I can go a couple of months without picking the camera up. And yes, it, it initially feels rusty when I pick it up. But normally, um, say, for example, I, I've been busy working up to my winter tour season and I've, I haven't picked the camera up for a month or so. And then I actually go on the tour and, and start shooting with the guests. It it's pretty quick for to blow those cobwebs off and um okay the camera pretty much becomes a an extension of my arm probably in yeah. over the, the course of a few minutes but um but yeah i mean it, it's I, and i can definitely appreciate it. i mean i i have this space that i've got here it's not a big a big space but when i opened when i started um you know quit my old day job 13 years ago to become a, a photographer Part per se, I um I decided that I I needed to have a space away from the family space, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. I I rented the set. It's the second and third floor of a, of an apartment building, um, and so we we do all of our living and family stuff downstairs. But once I come upstairs to the third floor, this is my space, um, and I I sort of I've got a, a pulley system. I'll pull pull a, a background down and just just photograph stuff. Um, you know, or I'll take a walk down to the river and um, grab some some shots of the flowers there and things like that. So I do keep my hand in, but um, for me, most of the time, it's it's more a case of trying to. I'm like, for for example, at the moment, it's so hot here. I I I only go outside. Um, I mean, I'm I'm doing I do archery, so I, I go to archery three times a week, and that oh. I get, end up covered in covered in sweat and have to come back and take a shower. But uh, apart from that, at the moment, I avoid going outside as much as possible. Um, but as soon as the fall comes along, I'm going to be off. I've got a, a few locations that I want to uh, do a reconnaissance trip for a new tour that I'm thinking of. So. Um, yeah, I'll be in another month or so. I, I will, well, maybe two months. I'll be back out there, and the camera will become a part of my arm again. Um, and are those tours are they more 
like workshop based or are they more kind of guide based? It's both. My my tours are essentially um, we go somewhere beautiful and we we do the photography and I help people with their photography as much or as little as they want. Um, I'll do sessions on processing when we're at the hotel and things like that. Um, okay. So yeah, they're, they're, I call them tours and workshops. Um, okay. And yeah, the, the, they are essentially a bit of both, but if, if it's the person that's attending is a beginner, I'll spend as much time as they want to get to really suck as much of my knowledge up as possible. If they're an advanced photographer, they don't probably won't need or want to listen to everything that I mm. talk about. So it's really okay. it's up to the the participant as well. Cool. Anyway, join one one day. Oh yeah, that would be great. So Bali now is your new home. I mean, why Bali? Is there and and that's not a, a negative thing. It's a beautiful place. But out of all of the places that you've you've you know possibly thought about, why Bali? Really good question, and and everyone asks me that um, quite rightly because it's it's very much seen as a more of a tourist destination than a than a than an expat destination, if that makes sense. Mm. But after after making the decision that we wanted to exit Hong Kong, whether that was going to be a a three month um, process or a three year process. Um, we we quickly narrowed down. We knew we didn't want to go back to the UK. We never want to go back to the UK. Um, you know, I've been fortunate enough to experience visiting many countries. Some some of the the kind of the 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 more I guess destination friendly countries multiple times. For example, the US. Um, after being there so many times for many years, I know that I don't want to go to the US um, mm. for for many reasons. The same mm. with a lot of countries in Europe. And so that kind of left us with, and we love Asia. We love Southeast Asia. We love, mm. we love um, the history, the many, many different cultures, the, the, um, the geography. I mean, there's so much beauty here and so much variety. Um, and I was always in love with Indonesia since I first came here 10 years ago. Mm. Um, I'm a big scuba diver. So I used to go to all these scuba diving places, kind of a mecca for scuba diving in Indonesia. And so I, I just learned, you know, I experienced it a little bit more, really loved the people, really loved the, the culture and really loved the landscape. And mm. so, and the, the climate, we're warm weather people and, um, you know, just, it just kind of fit. We got married here because of that, um, some of those reasons in 2018, my wife and I got married here in Bali and, you know, we've just, I don't know, we just have an affinity for it. So when we thought mm. about moving, the added bonus of somewhere like Bali was the cost of living. Mm. Um, it, you know, you can't stay in somewhere like Hong Kong for that long mm. if you, you're not getting paid. And so we didn't want to be handcuffed too much to, to a job or to, to income, necessary income, if we didn't have to. So all of those kind of ingredients fit together. And um, yeah, we, we, we don't regret it. It's, be, it's been difficult. I won't, I won't lie like it is moving to any country when you're 40 years old. Um, uh, it's a completely different way of living coming from Hong Kong, which was, which is very different. Um, and so it took us, it took us a good six months to, tr to really settle in and actually a full year to build a community and, and a quickly realize the photography community here is incredible. You know, there's, there's a lot of, it is quite a transient place, but there's many, many photographers, especially young photographers who come and hone their craft here or, or use this as a base to, to work various, um, especially travel photography is huge here. Um, mm. people bait, a lot of people base themselves here to, to launch to various jobs around the world. Um, because one reason is it's cheap, but it's also mm. has this environment and culture that's conducive to, to that type of person. So it it kind of it kind of fit with what we wanted at the time um so yeah we're really happy here that's great that's great I, and i i i completely understand the the feeling when you find uh, when you get an affinity with with a, a place so yeah i mean i i came to japan in 1991 and i uh i i was homesick for 3 days 
And then on the fourth morning, I woke up and realized that I didn't want to leave. <laughs> it was really weird. It was just, <laughs> it was like, like flicking a switch. Um, wow. and so that's essentially 32 years ago now. And I, I, uh, I'm still here and I'm, I no longer have a British passport as we were, as I was saying before we yeah. uh, hit the record button. So anyway, so excellent. I, I have seen obviously in your, on your website and you've sent me some images to take a look at. Um, and I want to, I'm going to actually share my screen now and open up your images just so that, you know, uh, so that the audience can see what we're looking at as well. But, um, here we go. I'm going to share my screen and let's, um, let's open this up. Like, uh, so if you, what I would like to do, we've got 10 images. Um, I've got a few comments on some of them and, and, you know, I, I'll interject those, but I initially just want you to quickly tell us a little bit about each of the images, if you could. So what about, what's this first one? It, I think it's, it's Mongolia, right? Yeah. So this is a photo of, um, e the Eagle Hunters of Mongolia in the, in the Altai mountains. Um, I went there back in 2018 and, um, you know, spent some time living with these nomads and, and these, this is a long standing tradition of using eagles to hunt, uh, foxes, birds, um, ferrets, whatever, you know, kind of, um, animals that these birds can catch. They can catch anything up to the size of a, of a fox, which is incredible. Yeah. Um, and they live with the, they live with these eagles. They, they, they are their life. Essentially they have them mm. sitting in the living room with them. It's, it's very strange. So yeah, these, these eagle hunters captured my attention a while back and really allowed me to hone my craft of, even though this, this photo isn't a portrait, 90% of the, this series was portraits and, um, mm. the beautiful light there the the beautiful people and just the the aesthetics of how they lived in their mud huts and um the very easy way of life seems easy but slow paced way of life until they have to go hunting so i went on a couple of kind of hunting expeditions with them and this this was part of it it was more staged um but you know i wanted to get a photo of them uh galloping at full speed and so um yeah this was well, this was with um when i had a sony a7r3 and at a 100 to 400 and um caught this shot at sunset with with the dust um mm. co coming up as, as they gallop so uh, incredible incredible people incredible animals yeah where is the sun in relation to this is it coming from the left or the right? left or yeah from, from, from the, the left, left. okay yeah. yeah it's it's a i mean i i love dust fog mist rain anything that <laughs> anything that puts particles in the air um, cause it really, it enables us to really see the atmosphere and, and it creates atmosphere as in, you know, the, the, the feel of the image. And this is absolutely stunning. It, oh, it was the first one that, that opened up when I, when I unzipped your images folder and it's absolutely wonderful. Um, I'm aware Thank of you. the Eagle Hunters and it, it, it's one of those, uh, one of those things that I, I would also love to shoot, but, um, I don't know if I'll get there very soon, but it, this makes me want to go even more. Uh, it really is. <laughs> it's um, freezing. I mean, we went, most people go in the summer. Mm. Um, we went in the winter because it was, it was a lot cheaper. And I wanted that, um, I wanted that atmosphere. And, yeah. and uh, th this, I remember, I'll never forget taking this shot because um, the, I was with a couple of other guys, their cameras froze. It was minus mm. 30 and below. Mm. Mm. And so you're trying to take a photo, as I'm sure you've experienced with multiple layers of gloves on and, mm -hmm. you know, multiple layers of clothes and hoping that the, the camera just doesn't break on you. Yeah. Um, yeah. so yeah, it was, uh, I, I would, would recommend going the summer, but there's something about the winter and, and the sun, obviously that far North in the, in, in the, um, in the summer you would get really nice long sunsets mm. and sunrises so yeah um yeah. yeah there's 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 pros and cons i guess yeah i'm i'm good with cold i'm not so good with heat but i um i i have 
I believe I have what's what's called fisherman's response or hunter's response. And I even in minus twenty five, minus thirty, I actually wear just just glove liners. What? I don't wear gloves what? because so that I can use my 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 hands get warm when I'm cold, essentially. So only if I'm standing around they get cold. And I've I've almost had right. frostbite a few times because I only have thin gloves on. But the moment I start to photograph my I, I'm hunting essentially, and oh, yeah. this Northern European gene kicks in, and it says, "Okay, you need your dexterity. Here's here's some blood for your hands," and so it's really nice. <laughs> I didn't even know that was a thing. I wish yeah. I had that. I think I've got yeah. the opposite. <laughs> Just bad <laughs> circulation. <laughs> oh dear. Um, let me see if I can switch this. I think I need to come out of um, full screen to actually switch images and um, this next one is an absolutely an, another stunning image tell us a little bit about this this was one of the first photos i took in bali um so yeah. it has a kind of special place in my heart and um i'll tell you about the woman in a minute but this was um a very very simple rice field in bali and um they're obviously you know they're ubiquitous here they're, they're, they're everywhere and mm. You know, a lot of people come here to photograph the rice fields and I didn't want to do that. I wanted them to be an element of the photo, mm. but I wanted the, to, to capture the people who work. Oh my goodness, they work at such long hours, even into mm. the ages of what this woman is. She's late 80s. Mm. I mean, that that for me is something that I just, you know, we, we just don't experience that in the West, really. And, mm. um, you know, a lot of these old people are walking with, almost 90 degree backs and oh, you know, they yeah. just we get it in japan the, as well and the 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 thing that catches me is how friendly these people are and and that's mm. what i wanted to try and get across with the, this mm. face and hopefully i do um the lighting technical aspects i mean you've got the the sunset um coming from the left and i wanted some rays i didn't quite get the rays but i got some kind of haze in there mm. um i wanted that in the corner and um this is obviously staged. I mean, they, they are working in their field, but I, I, mm. I got them for 20 minutes to, to kind of give me some of their time, which is, mm. which is kind of how I do it. Um, most of my shots are staged, but they're the real people in their real environments. So mm. it's kind of a, mm. a bit of both. Um, I had a pro photo, um, uh, B one X, uh, sorry, no B 10 plus. I think it was, um, it was a few years ago now. And, uh, and a pro photo one thirty five uh octobox which mm. is kind of my go-to equipment on location if i need you need a little punch of light and i'm i'm probably 50 percent my images have a little punch of artificial light um just to bring that subject out so i can have all of the environment in mm. usually a, a you know golden hour in there golden hour blue out in there but also having the subject stand out from that background mm. And yeah. so kind of uh, front left, I've got the, the, the soft box, uh, the octa box pointing at 45 degree angle, giving that kind of Rembrandt lighting on her face. Mm -hmm. um, and she was, I only, <laughs> usually I get, try and get to know the subjects as well as I can. So I'm with a, with an assistant and my fixer, and he's obviously speaking the local language. They don't speak any English. Mm. Um, and I thought she wasn't very, she was very, very smiley. All she did was smile and laugh. Mm. I thought, oh, I'm doing something right. And um, not, n not until the end did I realize she's actually deaf. <laughs> so oh. getting her to pose the way I wanted to pose and hold up her sheath, um, I think you call it a sheath. Do you call it a sheath? Uh, si scythe, uh, uh, what do you call it? Scythe. Sickle. Scythe, that's the word. Sickle. Yeah. Um, having that, uh, having her just, just get it the way I wanted to get it, um, was easier than the easier than I thought. Now I know that sh she was deaf. So, wow. um, yeah, this was really just a pure documentation of a typical rice mm. farm worker, mm. um, into her, I think she was 88, but mm. just, just a beautiful lady and, and a beautiful shot. Yeah, it absolutely is. Um, I, I think that you've, the lighting, from a photographer's perspective, it, it's obviously lit. And, you know, you've obviously got the softbox there. But because you chose to put it on the same side as the sun, it almost feels like 
sun mm. wrapping around her face. And, and it just, it's so beautifully done. And it's, this is one of the first ones that I saw on your website when I was looking through and, and uh, it really is so beautifully done. And I really, I, um, sorry, go on, go on. No, go ahead. No, I'm really, uh, you, you bring up, brought up a good point actually. And I tell this to, to some people who, who want advice. Um, I often get these kind of questions and, the artificial light thing is is a contentious issue with the purists, and a lot of people dismiss it immediately. And I guess I can understand why, but it, it depends on what your at- intent is with it, mm. and mm. obviously how you use it. I mean, you see many photos out there with people overusing or mm. overpowering the artificial, and it just looks yeah. tacky, porcelain-like, um, artificial, and just not nice. Yeah, in my opinion, mm. I'm so 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 keen on just using it as subtle as possible. If I if you could use it on the lowest setting possible, use mm. it on the lowest setting possible. Mm. And if you can mm. still bring out just a little bit of, I, I just like to say a punch of light, just a tiny little mm. of light yeah. onto someone's face, then that's how you do it. Obviously, the materials help. You know, the, the, the closer you can get, the bigger the light, the softer the light, it mm. makes it look mm. more natural. Um, you know, and I know some people who actually put the light as close to the face as possible and then just Photoshop the light out. I never really wanted to do that, A, because I'm lazy and I don't want to use Photoshop as if I don't have to. Mm. Um, but B, I just felt that was a little bit even less authentic than uh. than do it doing it the way I do it. But yeah, subtlety mm. for me in photography is is key with everything, with yeah. pre production, oh, production and, and post. Yeah, you're doing it. I mean, if you go too close with the light, you start to, the, the light becomes overpowering and you you mm-hmm. lose the ambient light. But the balance that you're getting between the ambient light that you, your flash has no way of getting to, like in the, the distant hills there and stuff like that, you're, you're using it as a fill light. And it's really just, yeah. it's perfect. It's subtle and very very nice i mean it's it's high quality work and and this was i mean i i have to tell you i mean i i get asked if by people all the time to, to if you'd like to interview so and so and that but when i saw your work I, it, it was like a three second decision it was okay oh, I, that's I, very kind I, of you. Thank I, you. I really wanted to get you on to share this so uh, and this is Thank why you. i mean you're doing such a beautiful job of this and I, I had one other question, and this is not, a, again, not a negative thing. It's all beautiful, but this is the only lady that has a smile. I noticed that a lot of your other work, the people are not smiling. Um, I Is that a conscious decision? Yes. And yeah, now, actually, I wouldn't probably. say she has a smile. This, this is, I want very to be nice as na- natural yeah. as possible. Yeah. 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 So the, the, the natural element of it, um, I, I, there's something about when you put a camera in front of, so 90% of my subjects have either not been photographed before or not not had someone like me specifically want to photograph them. Mm. They've had, might've had selfies before or they've never mm. had a professional shoot before and certainly not outside on location. Mm. So immediately, as soon as I, if I were to not kind of brief them or get, make them feel a bit more at ease and break the ice, and that's a completely different topic altogether. But mm. if I was to just put a camera in their face, their natural reaction is to smile and pose. Yeah. Now, the posing side of it is is kind of okay, but they tend to pose like anyone would, like quite rigidly. And I'm, yeah. I'm demonstrating yeah. on camera here, so apologies to your audience, but quite not rigidly and then smile like a fake smile. It's like they're not yeah. smiling because they I've made them laugh. They're smiling mm. because they think that's what they should do for, right. for a yeah. photo. Yeah. So immediately I'm kind of like, well, no, I, I, I know this is all has an element of fakeness, but you're a real person in a real situation. And I want to document your, as much of your natural emotions mm. and natural look as possible. So mm. usually speaking, that is when they um, relax and relax their face. Mm. Um, when when they don't smile, it it just adds a little bit more mood and drama, which is kind mm. of the thing I like. You know, I don't I don't um, uh, I don't want to be depressing here, but life isn't all happy smiles and stuff. Um, we're not. I'm not doing family shoots. I'm not doing selfies. I'm not doing something along those kind of um, 
kind of lines, I guess. And mm. I want people to express with their eyes. I want people to express with their hands. They're way more powerful than than a smile is. So, mm. you know, and sometimes sometimes it comes naturally because they are they're not very happy or they're struggling mm. or they're in pain or something like that. This lady, she just couldn't help but smile. So I just had to mm. temper that a little bit. Mm. Um, yeah, I think I did get well, some some photos. It, it, that were, just had her laughing. Yeah, it, it's very subtle, but again, like like the light, it's very subtle, but there's a bit of yeah. a smile there. Um, well, well, obviously, we'll go on to look at some of the others. You just reminded me, I think it was Chris Orwig who wrote a book about yeah. um, portrait portraits, and you reminded me there. He he talks about a session. He got a he got a few minutes with Ben Harper, the singer, and he after taking a few shots he said ben could i get you to smile and ben harper said to him i smile with my eyes man and and and, that, and literally when you look at him sometimes he's got the this a slight angle of his eyes and it, it's almost as though you know he when he's happy you can tell in his in his eyes in his and eyes. not on his face on his his mouth which and you just reminded me of that so let me move on to the next one. Let's see. Here we go. The fisherman. Let's tell us about this. This was about as staged as I get. So mm. I um I had a very clear idea of this was in Bali as well. And um obviously there are many, many local people here rely on fish every day to, mm. to just live. So the fishing community is is huge. Obviously, it's an island surrounded by water. So um, I wanted that to be a part of my Bali series. And but for those who don't know Bali, uh, a lot of people come here to surf. So getting a shot of someone fishing that isn't in the middle of the ocean was a challenge just because of waves. Um, mm. There are very, very few calm areas in Bali. Mm. Um, we found a place that was relatively, you can see on the photo, there was still some, some not waves, but there's, it's not flat. Yeah. And, um, I wanted to, you know, I was watching this guy for a long time and kind of knew the area we wanted to strip. We did a, we did a recce the day before at both sunrise sunset and we're happy with the location, just needed to find a person that was representative of what they do down there at that location, uh, every morning. And this this guy was, you know, a young young chap who would who would basically take his tiny little boat out every, you know, every morning for and go back and forth, back and forth with fish. And this is how he would kind of bring the fish out. Mm. I didn't want to get the boat in. I wanted to be this to be kind of minimalist because I wanted the sun, the the backlight, the sun to do the work. And then again, just a tiny little pop of light to to bring his face out. Mm, um, mm. And th what I like, what I wanted and like that I got was the sun coming through the net um, mm, behind him. Yeah. So it yeah. just adds some adds some depth. Um, yeah. So yeah, this, this guy, he was great. He was cold by the end of it because he was standing around for 20 minutes um, while I was getting <laughs> pushed over by <laughs> by the waves and the light uh, was in the water. Uh, yeah, it was, it was challenging, but um, you know, I wanted that glow of a of a fisherman coming back in with with some fishy caught. Um, yeah, and this is the excellent. way I, I I envisioned it. Yeah, uh, again, another beautiful and, and again, the very subtle lighting. Um, but yeah, beautiful. I actually thought with this that you'd probably just use the ref uh, a reflector um, rather than a you know pop light into it. So again, that just shows how subtle and how how well you're doing what you're trying to do here. So wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, we did actually. It's funny you you brought that up because we did uh, have a reflector. I but I didn't have one big enough, um, and one that wouldn't at, at the time. And and this is, I guess, a lesson for preparation. I just had a small. Uh, gold reflector and it just it just didn't work it was it mm. was too reflective almost i see and um and so this was just a very very uh it, it just, the, the soft box provided that even softer film mm. light um which which just seemed to work mm. you know i i've i have uh, over the years i've used various colored reflectors and i i had one gold and silver 
and the gold was way too hot, uh, warm, mm -hmm. and the silver mm -hmm. was way too harsh. I, I often find that even if you want a bit of warm sunlight, if the light reflecting off the white is is warm, you get warm light anyway. So, yeah, yeah. I, I, I've i never really been a big fan of gold reflectors. But excellent. Let's jump. Let's move on to the next one. Another beautiful shot. Tell us about this. This was um, quite a recent one uh, back in February this year. And... Mm -hmm. um, I we did a tour of um, East Java, which is one of the the big islands in Indonesia and, and the home mm. of Jakarta, the capital. And mm. on the east side, there are there are various subcultures um, surrounding a multitude of volcanoes. So the the landscape is beautiful, and there are there are these tiny little kind of tribes that. You wouldn't think of tribes. I mean, they're just cohorts of people. But once mm. you get to know them and what their belief systems are, and how they live their life, um, it's it's fascinating. And and this this is a shaman um, who who practices a specific form of spirituality spirituality, where he um, uses, I guess, what would you say, uh, incense and smoke to allure spirits um into human bodies to mm. basically excise them of any evil spirits I so see. you know we watched this um we watched this young guy get possessed essentially um whether you believe in that stuff or not it was a it mm. was just a good good visual experience this mm. guy went crazy uh did things i didn't know um a human body could do uh, he was eating charcoal, and that's why I wanted this in the photo. And he uses this as essentially a coconut shell um, mm. that he puts various substances in and lights them. And he gets this really um, incandescent smoke that he uses to, uh, that he gets this subject, he gets his um, patient, I guess, to smell and then go into this trance-like state. And so I wanted to capture the shaman himself in a in a peaceful, um, not praying, but a spiritual spiritual state with mm. his tool, which is mm. essentially his 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 coconut shell filled with smoke and fire, yeah. and with the Bali, um, sorry, not with the Bali, with the Indonesian kind of palm trees as as a backdrop, with a tiny yeah. bit of sun sun coming through there. So the, that the yeah. angle, the angle of me on the ground, I wanted to portray a, a feeling of power with the with the shaman so that's kind mm. of the, the technical explanation from it i guess yeah oh and yeah you've achieved all of it i mean everything it, not just this photo but all of your photos everything that you have in the frame is helping to tell the story of of that you're obviously trying to relay um you know okay. the trees like the, the sea in the last one the rice field in the first one it, you know the the second one the the one even the eagle guys you know obviously with the dust and the the landscape you you everything that you put into the frame you i i see that you're very careful to make sure that it all adds to the story and nothing in there that doesn't it's probably why it make why it's such stunning work thank you thank so, you not at all let's move on to the next one another excellent shot tell, tell us about this one uh this was um on the same project well it's a slightly different project but on the same trip um mm. this lady is part of the tenga tribe in the bromo valley of indonesia now, bromo is very well known for its huge volcano and there's uh, there's actually a triad of volcanoes all in this beautiful valley, um, which is just a stunning thing to look at. But a million people have have shot that, and it's great mm. to visit. But I wanted to capture, well, who you know, what is this area about? Who are the people? What do they normally do? It's a very agricultural area, and mm. um, I, I have this thing with shooting. I I, I really enjoy shooting agricultural um environments mm. with with my subjects I, d I don't know why i guess because there's some cool uh tools that we can use and props and like here mm. with the motorbike and the this grass you see them you know this was on the last day of the trip and i'd spent five days just watching people go up and down mountains and valleys on their 
really old kind of rickety motorbikes carrying huge sacks of grass. So I was like, why, where's all this grass going? It goes to their horses and they, because the, the terrain is so mountainous and a lot of it can't be accessed by motorbikes or cars, they mm. use horses just literally wow. to, you know, carry stuff every day. So, um, it, I, I did get some photos of them, the horses, but I really love this one mainly because of the atmosphere. And um, we had really, really bad weather that that trip. Unfortunately, we went kind of at the end of rainy season. And so I didn't, what I had, had planned with, um, you know, some beautiful landscapes in the background with my subjects, I had to kind of pivot and go, well, we, you know, let's go into the clouds. So we went up to the top of this, this volcano and um, there was a really kind of well conditioned road there. I was like, well, this is amazing. Mm. And just passed this lady on a bike. And, um, you know, we, I'd asked a few people before I found her and they weren't interested, which is mm. fine. Like it happens all the time. Yeah. yeah it's rare that yeah. I can ask someone and they're, they're up for it. And, uh, she was, she was very keen. She's like, yeah, no problem. Obviously we, we give them a little bit of money to spend some time with us, but mm. she was just a depiction of, of the people there and really part of their daily ritual of carrying these these huge sacks of grass heavy sacks of grass and uh mm. up and down mountains to to fields and to feed feed the horses wow yeah i'm i'm interested in obviously again the atmosphere is is beautiful and I, the the light on the motorbike adds so much. It, did you mm. have any technical issues sort of balancing that light, or you know, was, yes. it, was it pretty easy? No, Martin, okay. I have I, Martin, I have technical issues every shoot. I mean, it's it's, <laughs> um, it's just part of the part of the process. I mean, the biggest, yeah. pro, to be honest, the biggest difficulty with this was the rain, and um, it wasn't quite rainy on this shot, but it was. It was almost like the UK drizzle you get so by, you know, by the, after 10 minutes, our cameras were getting wet and the light mm. was getting wet. And so, mm. you know, we obviously prepare as much as we can for that, but, um, getting that light, the, the motorbike light, which was in and out. I mean, we're talking Indonesia, uh, rural, poor Indonesia where the bike you know, could barely make it up the hill and the light only turns on sometimes and then it flickers out and then it's, so mm. that was an issue. She had to keep, she didn't in this photo, but most of the photos that I took of her, she had to keep a hand on the accelerator. And I was like, I, can't, mm -hmm. I don't want that. I want her to, I want her to be in a natural pose for it. Not yeah. as if she's going biking. It's just the way yeah. I, I wanted it to look. So we got lucky with this and, um, you know, the light, I think I did bring it out in post a lot more than than what it is in raw, but um, yeah, yeah, that was we did have some technical issues with that. Yeah, yeah I thought probably so. It's it, again a beautiful shot. So let me move on. Um, tell us about this one, uh, Mohammed. Yeah, um, him and I were friends after this shot. We got to know each other really well. He he, this was in Oman. Um, mm. I took a trip. I, I had a, a small amount of time off between actually flying jobs, uh, in Dubai. I was like, well, I'm not going to sit around in Dubai. I'm not a huge fan of Dubai. I, I don't want to sit there for, for, I think I had five days, um, oh, and not do anything where I can kind of go into the desert and see what's, see what's about, see, meet some people. And, um, it would try and try my best to get, you know, if anyone knows the history of that area of the world. Um, used to be kind of ruled by the Bedouins who were essentially shepherds, camel shepherds, mm. and were nomadic as well. They'd moved from one place to another throughout the whole of the Arabian Peninsula. Mm. And when Dubai and Abu Dhabi kind of were, um, came along, essentially were created, um, 95% of them, uh, from, from, from the UAE, as we know today, 95% of them got jobs and were westernized and didn't need to continue with their way of life. So I was, that was a challenge to me. I was like, well, let's go and try and find some. Couldn't find any in the UAE, went to hire a car after speaking to various kind of fixers, guides and people in the area. I was like, where can I find some authentic Bedouins? And they said, well, you're not going to find them in the UAE. And uh, you, you might find some in this area of Oman, which is, 
from Dubai. Oh, I can't remember now. Maybe a five, six hour car journey. So I rented a car, got across the border for a recce, found a hotel and just went to this village, which is uh, its own island, essentially on the northeast tip of Amman. Mm. And um, befriended a guide who kind of showed me around and met these people. And this village was in the middle of nowhere. I had to get a boat there. And um, I said, you know, explained kind of none of them spoke English, but I had the guide there, which is essential for me. And he explained what I wanted to do. And uh, and so I spent two very fast days with them. So, look, I just want to get some photos. Mm-hmm. Technical challenges were that it, the village was nestled in a in a uh, in a bay that was surrounded by huge cliffs and so getting natural light was soft natural light in golden hours was almost impossible and the Mm. sun wasn't going the right way so well this is you have to work with what you got so i didn't get many outside got a couple outside which were nice but this one um was kind of powerful and and quite emotional at the time I, I said to this man who was he was kind of the lead not the leader but he was the most forefront man that i i was with at the time and he was really happy to meet me he had me in his home we ate together drank together and he had limited english so at least i could converse with him a little bit I said look i hope it's not too sensitive but you the core the core values of your life and your village and the way you live actually aren't what i thought they were in terms of camels desert shepherd not in this part of the world Mm. you live in and around uh, islam and how can i capture something that means something to you but also to others and um you know this was kind of it he showed me his uh, the area where he he prays a lot and um obviously he has the quran there Mm. and uh you know i learned a lot you know it it was it was uh, interesting how ignorant I was of of that religion, and not in a mm. in a nasty or, or derogatory way. Just you know, I, I, you can always learn more. And he taught mm. me a lot about um, his values, his beliefs, how he prays, and mm. um, it just uh, just lucky for me that this room had a a window, uh, a kind of a window, a sh- shuttered window that mm. I could put light in outside of that window was another kind of room which was completely dark so if you if you shut that shutter pitch Mm. black so immediate challenge there was to somehow get light in because the aesthetics of the room and the composition that naturally was given to me was perfect and it was his Mm. room his rugs his quran his his moment of prayer and um so I, I I had the softbox. I put it outside and flashed away. And uh, oh. he allowed me to photograph while he was praying, yeah. which which was a privilege. And you know, yeah. it's 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 not as sensitive as I thought it might be. But um, mm. yeah, this was this was special. Yeah, I enjoyed I enjoyed it. Yeah, that's amazing. I I I realized as you were talking that that was that was softbox light coming through there. Mm. And I'm thinking, wow, what an amazing job again. Um, but yeah, yeah you, you you touched on a lot of things there. I, I I did a couple of tours in Morocco a few years ago, and um, our guide there was he 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 talked to me a lot about the the religion, and you know he, he talked about his Quran readings when he was a kid. And we, you know, we got into some very deep conversations and I, I, I can completely understand, you know, that when, when you talk with people in, um, that live that life, it's, it's a big eye opener. And I think it, it helps to remove a lot of the stigma that we tend to have in, in Western countries. It, you know, a lot of, not everybody, but I'm sure a lot of people. And I, I really enjoyed those experiences and this came, it, it all brought brought it all straight back. Um, I actually bought a Quran on my last visit, um, but I uh, it's obvious I can't read it. The guy said, but you know, he said, would you like to get a, an English translated one? And I said, I I don't want to offend you. I said, I don't want to read it. I just want to own it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and just look at the the writing. You know the the way that the it's such beautiful writing. Um, yeah. 
but yeah, um, again, to- totally wonderful. agree. And, and you know, like like a lot of cultures, a lot of belief systems, um, there are extremist viewpoints, right? And unfortunately, those. I mean, look at politics. Same mm. same kind of belief structure, right? It's mm. the those extreme opinions get the headlines. Um, and obviously, obviously, uh, outside of kind of the the tragedies that happen, but mm. just in the the generalization and the way people have to process it to make sense of it, mm. they will they will just make decision. Well, I don't like that, or I don't mm. I don't agree with that way of believing. So, well, there's so many nuances mm. um, within that, and you know, Islam specifically, there are very 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 there are many different forms of it or nuances that that are that are attributed to it according to not only the country that the people are living in, but also the history of those sectarian areas, et cetera, et cetera. So I totally agree with you. And, and actually, you know, this is why I'm a huge fan of podcasts and just generally mm. discourse. That's the mm. biggest educator in the world is meeting mm. other people and talking to them and more importantly, listening. Right. So, mm. This is where, you know, if photography is is secondary to that, for me anyway, um, mm. and, you know, having having those experiences and traveling it as a privilege, if you're able to use that privilege to either educate people or open someone's eyes, or if it's just open your own eyes, mm. um, then then do it. Um, mm. So, yeah, it was th- this was a this was a privilege for me, for sure. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You know, you you. um I mentioned the writing a moment ago, and I, one of the biggest appeals for me when I moved to Japan was the was the writing system, yeah. and you just reminded me of that the Japanese have a number of different ways of of um, writing the word to to listen. Um, one of them is more like to hear, which is more passive, and you know you it just comes into your ears. And that's okay. it. But the other one is written in a way that the the particles that make up the character, um, they actually represent you moving your body towards the person and and looking at them while you're listening. And that's really important wow. because a lot of people don't, you know, you can sit like a doctor in an office can be typing away, writing notes, looking at their computer screen while they're listening to you. And all they're doing is hearing you. But the moment they stop writing and turn their chair and look towards you, you feel much more engaged than as though they mm-hmm. really are listening to you. And that you, that point that you made there, it just brought that back to me as well. It's, it's all interesting. Yeah, it's beautiful stuff. So let's move on to the next one. Let's see. Tell us about this shot. Look at the, look at the face on the camel. Isn't that grimace? It's be, it's brilliant. Yeah, this was uh, in the same area, and um, I actually call this one Lost Tribes um, because this this man is a Bedouin, a young Bedouin, and mm. his job was to herd ca- camels right for the day, mm. every day. And so he had he had the way of, with dealing with these cameras because obviously, as, as you know, when you are trying to photograph animals or children, you've got mm-hmm. a big task on your hands, right? Mm-hmm. To to get what you want. So because they're so unpredictable, um, I wanted a photo that was angular. I I wanted this this feeling of movement, and I wanted the camels in line with the shepherd. And so I had a very specific way of, no, I need the camels here and I need you here. It's like, mm. and I, I could see him thinking, well, what do you, how do you expect me to do that? These are two huge camels. Mm. Um, but he did it. We took, we, we tried quite a few times and um, I had an assistant here. So actually I, I, if I remember correctly, um, I did use a softbox, but I didn't need it in the end because the sun, mm. that's actually sunlight. Uh, on his face and i think mm-hmm. i just accentuated that a little bit wow. with again a tiny little subtle pop just mm. because he had really dark skin mm. and if i wanted the camel's lighter fur hair or whatever you call it mm. um to be as well exposed along with him then i just needed a, li- a, a little pop so 
um yeah he was walking along camels were walking and uh yeah i was lucky to get that really cool expression on the mm. on the lead camel's face yeah yeah that's what makes it but the guy as mm. well he's a he's really good looking he's got he's yeah. got that the the features and the you know just the shape of his face and the way the light's catching his um well it will be his right cheek and then going off mm. into darkness is really really nice um but the, yeah the light on the camel the, the the main camel the light on that um is absolutely amazing as well You've done a, a, I mean, every one of these uh, are stunning. Thank you. And Thank we're going to have to, I think I'm keeping you way too long. So I'm going to try and go, Not at all. Little, go a bit quicker yep. on these, but choose any um, other one. Tell us a little bit about this. This was um, a lady called Tattoo. And um, she was part of a Mentawai tribe, the Mentawai tribe uh, in Indonesia, in Sibirut, in Indonesia. And they, um, animist uh, belief system, live purely off the land and um, express their uh, belonging and spirituality with tattoos, jewelry, um, and, uh, and um, shamanism. So I went to visit them uh, many years ago now and um, lived in their house for, you know, just that wooden hut for four days. Mm. and just just got to know them essentially and and she was the life and soul of the party and they smoke like i've never seen anyone smoke it is <laughs> it's chain smoking to another level so i had to yeah. get photos of of them smoking it's just that what they were either smoking uh what i guess would be their kind of some form of weed and marijuana or some mm. kind of plant that they would smoke in these big mm. long cigarettes or we brought them as a as a gift, you know, thousand cigarettes or whatever it was, and they they got through those in a few days, no problem. <laughs> um, so she was she would sit in the corner of her house all the time like this, and just you know spout a load of nonsense and have a laugh and and smoke. And uh, I just wanted to to capture her really because she was just she was just super cool. But the, yeah. yeah, that whole experience was was mm, incredible. Yeah, yeah. Can you? So I'm not sure if that was the if you went on for the explanation, but you said animist, or was it the word um, about their religion yeah. or their beliefs? Can I've not heard that word. Is that what does what does it mean? Um, animist is is the belief that um, objects, uh, places, and creatures or animals all possess like a distinct spiritual essence. So really it's a form of spirituality with the earth and with all natural things, which is why okay. they live in, um, in natural surroundings. You know, they, they build, they, they eat whatever they kill. They don't have any kind of um, influence from, from the outside world other than the odd photographer coming or mm -hmm. um i think one of them has a phone so they kind of gather around that i i had an ipad with me um and i've never seen anyone react to an ipad as 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 they did so mm -hmm. there was about a family of 10 living under one roof and then obviously when they when they know some white essentially rich people according to them come to the area there's families from all over that come out and you end up with 50 people in the house and wow. you know just having fun with them and mm. them doing ceremonies and and when i got my ipad out obviously i was quite careful i had some expensive camera equipment lighting and laptop so but i i said look you know worst case i'm willing to you know worst case i'm willing to lose an ipad but i wasn't then they didn't steal anything but i put an ipad in front of them and literally i've never seen like 50 people circle around an ipad i think i had a movie on there and i just put something on for them in english they couldn't understand any of it but they would never seen one before so they were just transfixed but yeah wow. anyway animist animi animism is essentially a, a spiritual connection with with nature that's probably a that, way that's to say. very much like shintoism the japanese um uh, one, one of it? the two main japanese religions um that there, there's a there's a spirit in everything essentially um he, they say even a grain of rice if you waste a grain of rice you're upsetting the the 
the oh, the my. bigger scheme of things. So, I mean, my wife and Is I that... won't won't leave a, a even a, we eat every single grain in our bowl every every evening when we when we eat we won't leave anything. Um, and that's the yeah. the basis of the you know because I've been out for dinner with Japanese people before and it's polite to correct me if i'm wrong is it polite to leave some food or to not make sure you finish everything it, it's so it, there are two different contradictory ways of eating one is if you're out with someone it's it's impolite for them to not overfeed you to the point where you can't finish the food so it, you know they if you go to right. a hotel or a restaurant or something then generally There'll be more food there, and they end up. They've got a big as a as a nation. They've got a huge food loss problem, um, you know, through through waste. They 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 waste a lot of food in hotels and places like that. But in the home, most people are are a kind of spiritual and have this belief that you don't waste anything. Um, so it's it's kind of two sides of the of the same coin, which are very contradictory, but. Yeah, it it depends on the situation. Um, and is that why they bless people. a lot of um, objects as well? Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, if you go to, uh, on my winter tours, my wildlife tours, we actually go to a Shinto shrine and have a blessing. And if you go in there, there's always a shelf and a, and a few things at the back of the shrine where they have um, like fish and, and fruit and vegetables and everything and they're all put they're all taken to the shrine as, as offerings but they're all blessed and then they'll be either given back to the community having been blessed or the the shrine will use them um but they're 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 very much into uh, everything has a a god you know the, the the obviously the mountains the trees the land the insects everything has has its um has its god and that like you know a god is in every in everything around us so it's kind of how you it teaches you to be respectful to things there was there was even a and i'm saying this kind of as an amusing thing but it was it was there was a song that was very popular a few years ago about the god of the toilet and how this this young girl had been told by her grandmother about the god of the toilet and if you don't keep your toilet clean the, the toilet god will be upset with you and so she always thinks about her grandmother as she cleans a toilet and it was it's typical of how a lot of the japanese people pass on spiritualism and things like that through stories about about the gods and things and and uh, you know that sort of um i guess you know it would be the an animism did you say that you know, for the animism. it's that type of of religion so it's nice to uh, i've not heard that word but it's definitely a fit anyway great. let's try and get through these last few photos i think they've got two more um so again this was another one with no smiles which which makes it so much more powerful and um, tell us about this yeah so this was actually genuinely no smiles these were mm. um yeah I want to say this word not in an English way because it's derogatory in an English way, but this is the way they explain who they are. They were peasants of of Uganda, an area in Uganda called Jinja. And um, this was one of my first ever like photos I was happy with ever. This is probably um, six years ago now. Hmm. And this was also one of the first photos I'd used artificial light on. Hmm. And... Um, this family were, I, I saw this lady, and I actually have a video of it. I saw the lady in the middle cutting down um, these huge uh, groups of bananas from the tree just outside her house. And you can't really call it house. It's just like a, a mud hut, essentially. And um, I was there initially seeing the gorillas of Bawindi. And um, because I I was just really starting to get into photography and um, I still have a love for wildlife, I still do. I went from taking photos of gorillas down to the um, the ginger area, which was, you know, a different part of the country, but uh, where I wanted to see uh, how people lived down there. It was, it was known for just rural, um, authentic 
life essentially and um and that's what i i titled this photo that's life and this is oh, wow. this is their life this is their living room mm. this is their daily kind of um uh, daily food daily consumption and uh this is the only clothes they own um mm. it it through luck the the color of her dress match the color of the bananas i've got another portrait of her holding bananas on her head um and it took me a while this took me a while to get them to warm up to me and um mm. i guess in the middle of that warming up process i had this shot but once i kind of took shots and um showed them you know showing them is everything they mm. they loved it i gave them printouts mm. and just wanted to somehow give back and um, obviously gave them some money, which they were very thankful for and, you know, sat with them. And this was, this was my portrayal of them in, in their own habitat. And um, mm. it's a sad one for me because they are sad. They they were sad people. They were, they were suffering and, um, you know, visiting these types of villages uh is difficult because you're coming mm. in as, as a very rich person in comparison to them financially and um they have nothing they they literally mm. have nothing so sometimes to to photograph them almost feels like you're stealing from them mm. um which i felt a little bit at the time i had much less experience so i was you know i was i was both naive and and ignorant i guess mm. not that i upset them in any way i just felt i i definitely felt after that trip a little bit of unease that i had gone there to photograph people Mm. Even though I treated them as I do with everyone, like with full respect, gave them mm. as much money as I could and um, uh, gave them some photos that hopefully they still keep. I um, mm. actually went back uh, about a week later and they had their little printouts on, the, on, their, um, oh, no. on their wall in the house, which That's was really nice. lovely, lovely to That's see. Nice. Yeah. yeah, this is a, this was a kind of a sad, a sad photo. Mm. Um, mm. But yeah, that's, yeah. that's. That is life sometimes, and it's very yeah. much, um, um, it very much is for for them. Mm. Yeah. Again, you you're connecting lots of dots in my mind as I'm as I'm listening to your explanation. And um, the Himba people in Namibia, um, they the the him the word Himba um, is a, a Herero word. It means beggar. You know, and okay. not a lot of people know that they, you know, the Himba mm -hmm. people, they, they're a proud and a wonderful culture. They proud people with a wonderful culture, but they're the name given to them means beggar. Um, and that to me is, is kind of, again, sad. Um, but they live a very, very humble life. And, uh, I've, I've photographed them most years for the, for the last 13, well, last 10 years or so. Um, and, this, when you said about the, you know, not in a derogative way, but the, the word, use the word peasant, it kind of reminded me of that. Um, but also, I mean, I, I just, I know what you mean. I, we always, when we go to the Himba, we always take them, we give them money um, in the form of we will buy the, buy their souvenirs. But we actually, whenever we go to the Himba, we take them um, a car full of produce. We will take them. Mm -hmm um like a couple of like 50 50 pound sacks of of corn flour and uh, or maize right. um and we'll take them they 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 like the big tubs of vaseline because they can make the they mix ochre they they grind ochre and mix it with the vaseline now instead of goat's milk butter um because that starts okay. to go rancid so rather mm -hmm. than the goat's milk butter to make their cream that they put their or their ochres on the skin they like to mix it with Vaseline. So we take them big wow, tubs of Vaseline okay. and things like that. <laughs> um, but yeah, trying to help out as much as you can. You've got to try to help the people that you're photographing or it, it does feel like stealing. But I think you did as, you did what you could here. And you, you know. Yeah, I, when you're an individual, sure you can only you can only do so. Well, you can only do so much anyway, um, yeah, other yeah. than going there, building them stuff and basically yeah. just just funding directly whatever they want it, you know if you can't do that which nearly all of us can't then yeah. what can you do and if you're going to what feels like take something from them in the form mm. of an image i don't look at it like that at all but um yeah that's the way it may be perceived to them or to others then mm. obviously you have to 
pay them for their time or yeah. contribute to something or you know or what whatever it may may look like and i yeah. do that every everywhere we go um, yeah this was absolutely. just a bit more of a of a of a visceral kind of experience i guess with that yeah yeah okay this is the last one that tell us about this yeah, this was on the same trip, and this has been my most popular photo um, with people. And it's it's not my favorite, but um, the, the girl in green, I call this, um, was again a peasant. You can see by her clothes, that, like she she got given this dress um, uh, years ago, but before I, before I took the shot, and she bet she you know she barely takes it off, and um, she was playing with this this branch with leaves with her fellow brothers and sisters and people in the village and just having like these kind of fights. Mm. And, um, I found one of, uh, a, a hut which had really nice light in it and not so much of a, it was kind of a brick wall behind, which, which bounced a little bit of light, but it was just perfect for kind of a, mm. um, a, a kind of quasi studio type area. Mm. Mm. And, um, she was keen. She was, she was, you know, you can how tell if you're in a group of people, you can tell even with children, like, oh, maybe that one's a bit more keen for a photo than that one. And mm. um, through my fortune, she was very photogenic, um, just had this natural, that was purely natural look, natural uh, stance, natural hands. And it just all kind of clicked, excuse the pun. And mm. uh, yeah, she, she was, she was beautiful. And um, mm. I hope I get to see her one day. Uh, again but um that there's not much story behind this image it was just a beautiful little girl who who had nothing other than mm -hmm. a smile on her face and and friends to play with and mm -hmm. uh, and yeah. i wanted to take a photo of her so yeah it's the the color is is stunning the way it, yeah it really it really brings out the uh yeah it, the, like the color contrast between the darks and the the greens yeah. and the way the green is almost the same color in the dress and the the leaves but those mm -hmm. eyes that you know the look on her face this is almost it feels a little bit like tim is it tim curry's afghan girl um steve steve curry. mccurry yeah. Stephen, yeah, steve yeah, mccurry yeah. um yeah yeah that the afghan girl photo is absolutely you know that comes that came to me when i looked at this the eyes the way she's looking straight at you and you know, again the certain lens, sadness uh, certain sadness but yeah, beautiful young girl and um, yeah. absolutely stunning work. So what I'm going to do, but well, I'm aware I've 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 had you talking now, uh, including our pre-recording chat for uh, an hour and a half. So we're not we're going to try and wrap this up. Um, it's okay. I I was I got a couple of other things that I wanted to ask. One was if you have any advice for people that want to shoot portraits. Um, and if it, it can be really quick or as long as you want, but you know, anything, anything that, you know, cause you, you are doing such a wonderful job of this. And, um, have you got any advice for anyone that would like to do even just portrait work? Yeah. Um, well, first one is follow my YouTube channel. <laughs> I was, yeah. do a lot of, um, tips and tricks on there. And later in the year, I'm, I'm releasing a, a portrait masterclass. So stand by for that. But. But uh, yeah, I can run through a couple quickly that I've experienced, not through books, not through YouTube, not through just through failing. Mm. And that's probably the first step is just um, like with all photography, right? Be prepared to fail. But when it comes to to portraits, try not to worry too much about the technical stuff. And I know mm. that's easy for me to say, but people will see my shots and go, well, what light did you use or what? lens did you use and they're, they're all important if you have the mm. luxury of being able to choose but actually with portraits you know you are dealing with humans and that is both mm. a beautiful thing because they're so complex and full of depth if you if you're able to pull that out give yourself time let's put it in the context of maybe uh, an easy to understand context you have someone in a studio in a confined room with one light source whether that's natural light coming through a window or artificial light that immediately is going to be intimidating for for the person especially if they haven't done it before if they're members of the public and they're paying you to get some some cool portraits 
even if they're models and maybe they haven't met you before, they don't know the environment, it's always, always a little bit intimidating. Mm -hmm. There's always apprehension there and there's, there's a complete necessity to break the ice. So give yourself time to, that could be 30 minutes, could be 10 minutes, could be two hours. Uh, mm -hmm. I give myself an hour mm -hmm. and just to, just for them to know where the toilet is, where to sit, mm -hmm. what the backdrop is, what mm -hmm. my camera looks like, what the mm -hmm. setup is about, if they get to see the photos or not, where they're from, if they've done this before, what they're looking, looking for in terms of what type of images do they want. So there's a whole conversation. And even if that conversation means nothing, it mm -hmm. helps that person feel a little bit more at ease. And if you, if, if you don't kind of, have those skills, then maybe have someone else there. If you if you don't feel comfortable in yourself, because as you know as well, photographers, if you're dealing with another human, there's a little bit of pressure or there's a little bit of nerves there as well. You don't want to keep people waiting for too long and mm -hmm. oh, how am I going to get them to do this and how am I going to get them to do that? Most of the work comes from that the preparation um and just just chatting to them. Mm -hmm. Literally I've I've I, you can see it in someone's photo and um, I'm trying to demonstrate that with with my masterclass later in the year. Getting a stranger off the street, and I mentioned this earlier, I'll put them in front of the camera. You, they're going to be rigid. They're, they're going to be fake. They're not going to know what to do. They're going to be scared. And that will come across in the images. Hmm. If you can somehow find a connection, and I send my um, my clients questionnaires out about uh, at least three or four days before a shoot, so that immediately that's there is a connection that, oh they actually care about me and mm. oh i've got to answer and so now it becomes more of a collaboration i've got to mm. answer some questions and maybe i can have an input and even though i'm paying them i can kind of i'll take their advice but now i can also feel a bit more free to say what i want to say mm. and that's mm. that's really really important when you're trying to get the best out of eyes your best out of a face best out mm. of um, you know, oppose or even what what to do after that. Um, so that would that would be a big big tip for me. And the next one is can be applied across all photography. That's you know, practice, and um, mm. you can practice. The good thing with portraits, if you, if you live with someone else, or you know, if you have children, or you're married, or you, you know, even if you just have a flatmate or someone else you live with, you can just buy them a beer or buy them some sweets of it or whatever it is mm. bribe them to yeah. um be your test test uh, subject and um mm. sit them on your bed have a light coming from somewhere it doesn't need to be any fancy anything fancy just pra just practice and, and mm. understand where something like light is coming from and how that is going to change the look of a portrait the emotion of a portrait it could because you know as photographers we rely on light to tell as much of the story as anything else. If you mm. have exactly the same composition, the same subject and the same pose, but they both have completely different lighting, one's going to mean something compared to the other. Mm. And um, so, yeah, just practice, practice with that. Try not to worry about technical settings and just, um, yeah, practice as much as you can with, uh, with someone else essentially and one source of light and just, yeah. just practice away. Yeah. Excellent advice and uh, a wonderful conversation. I will start to wrap it up. Um, I am going to include your uh, Matt Jacob photography and your Mood Studio Bali links in the podcast. Is there, uh, can people get to your YouTube channel from there, uh, from, from your website? Yes, yeah, it's on my website. Um, on the home page is all my social links, and actually the website has a podcast um, page itself. So you can find me, um, obviously, on YouTube, youtube.com slash. So my username for all my social channels is the same. It's Matty J underscore A Y. So you can find me across Instagram, Twitter, um, uh, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts, and you know all the all the usual platforms uh, as well as mm. my website mm. excellent well i'll make sure that we you know the links go into there i'm sure people will come and uh check out your work it really is stunning it's been a pleasure to speak today and i uh it, was there anything else that you wanted to add before you leave or all good i don't think so i think i've talked myself out of um 
of <laughs> any other, <laughs> other conversation yeah. topics today. But thank you well, very much. It for was all me. good. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure to um to just talk to other photographers. So uh, yeah, thank you very well, much. It's it's been really enjoyable. Not at all. Not at all. It's about, I've, I've enjoyed the conversation. I hope to talk again at some point as well. Well, sure thank we you will. very much, um, Matt. We'll, uh, we'll catch thank up you. again. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much for listening today. I hope you enjoyed that conversation and the audio quality didn't spoil it too much. I tried to find some plugins and various ways to remove that, uh, that slight echo, uh, but I couldn't find anything that would do it properly so it's how it had to be i hope you enjoyed the conversation with matt he's a very talented photographer and i really enjoyed the conversation if you do enjoy the podcast and would consider supporting us via patreon go to mvp.ac slash patreon and there are various tiers of support from uh just basically helping out with a, a small comp- contribution all the way up to photography mentorships. And you can find details of that at mbp.ac slash Patreon. If you'd like to catch up with me, go to martinbaileyphotography.com and you will find links there to everything, including 820 episodes at this point on the blog. And you can find links to all of the social media that I'm into, as well as links to my tours and workshops and things like that. So thank you very much. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.